I just kind of pop in on my feed. <laughs> kind of fun. Uh, I just wanted to share uh, just kind of a short uh, insight. And I have to say, I am on a bit of a mission. I didn't really just started before Passover where I just felt very compelled to, you know, again, I can say reach out to the people that I know in my community that I've, Dennis and I have known and, and love, and we've had amazing conversations and we all know we're in this race to the finish line. <laughs> and hopefully we're beginning to see it maybe. But uh, one of the things that I have been doing, you know, and so I like, this is a little bit like a coming out sort of, I've been kind of, like I've said, alone with God for about eight years, just flat out Bible research. I've been a primary text researcher. I've said a lot of this and just really learning about our texts, who compiled them, how were they written, um, and always understanding that it, the how, the Jews, all right, I call them the house of Judah. That's kind of a biblical way. The prophets always referred to them or even... Um, they have always been the keepers of the Torah, of the Bible. This is the thing. Even the earliest, the church, when, when Yeshua, with Paul, with James the Just, uh, his brother, um, the earliest disciples, they were all Jews. I mean, this is something that in a mindset, I think we really need to grab a hold of this. Because you'll let, in my opinion, because history repeats itself, you'll never really grasp what's going on today. This world is very confusing, but part of it is because we've lost sight of who we are in the bigger picture. All right. So what I just want to say, I'm also I'm trying to bring some of my friends into sort of an understanding that was the first revelation that the Father gave to me. And it's not, it was a revelation to me because I'd never heard this. Nobody ever taught me this. I psh, never, I was a pretty good Bible reader. I mean, you know, uh, and when I saw it, when the father said, I was like, it revolutionized everything. It was a total game changer. And it, it has made my life 100% in my opinion, more fruitful. And, uh, I feel closer to the father. Everything about it, I think has benefited me in a personal walk. It has strengthened me. But I'm trying to explain to people that, you know, because I hear this a lot, like, especially out of the well, where's America in the Bible? Or or where are the Christians in the Bible? You know, we seem to get written out towards the end of the age. We can figure out why would this great nation like America, the greatest nation the world's ever seen, like not be in the Bible, especially at the end times. It kind of doesn't make sense, right? God forget. <laughs> Everybody else is in there. You still got Babylon in there, you know, which we can identify with. Or, um, you know, Jews, Israel's back in the land, the house of Judah. So you can identify them. And it's because of a very slow process that the enemy has really been trying to dumb us down. And why should we be surprised? It's happening in every other category of life. Um so while what I might be trying to say to some is sort of like an inconvenient truth, it, it, it's part of it is because as a generation, we are extremely biblically illiterate. I mean, this is a fact. I mean, it's like, you know, those guys that go out um, <laughs> on um, the street and they'll ask people questions like, you know, who is the 45th president of the United States or when was Andrew Jackson a president? And, you know, People really don't know. They don't know any of the history, really. I mean, but that wasn't always so for the nation, but biblically too. So this idea that we are totally in the Bible, the end times, but what we're called is not Americans or, or, or you know, or even even called saints in the Old Testament. I mean, there's a lot of words, we're, but, but um, we're called Ephraim, Ephraim, all right? We're the north. We are the multiplicity of seed that was promised to Abraham in the covenant he made, where he's, you know, the father said, I will make you a multitude of nations. I will make kings come from you. I will make your seed, you know, disperse and, and fill the whole earth. Okay. And if you look, 
my thing is, in my, you have, in my opinion now, it, it, the translations that I'm going to show you a verse that is so poorly translated, I'm like, I'm like, this started happening to me all the time. How can they be using these words when the Hebrew is so clear <laughs> over here? It's obvious the texts were written in Hebrew. Hebrew is, a, is the biblical, and it's a pure language. It, it, in my opinion, I've done a lot of study on it, and I'm going to teach, you know, try to put together some kind of classes or, or you know, I can't really teach Hebrew. I'm not, a, but I can explain how the language works. It's a chemical language more so. It's not necessarily a, you know, the common man language. They had Aramaic for that, all right? You know, like, the same because the Jews, they got, they had Yiddish for common language in Europe, but, but they, it, it's a, it's a, was prized and, and the, this is the way the scribes learn it. It's a very specific, letter specific way, scribal transmission that is, has got so many like locks and keys on it so that you really can't uh, mess it up. You're not supposed to. And the Jews have done a fabulously accurate job, in my opinion, because even the New Testament was written by Hebrew speaking Jews who had, who had become, um, who, 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 who were seeing in their day, in their time, the promised Messiah ben Joseph, the, the, that was the promised one who was going to come to deliver. Now, most people understand now, look at me, there were, you know, two obviously comings, right? He came the first time, he's coming the second time. So you have to cut people a little bit of slack for not necessarily, uh, prophecy tends to play out and then you can see it always the best in hindsight. <laughs> so it's easy to sweat. But I'm going to read a couple verses. So what I'm trying to say is our name biblically is, we're called the house of Israel. We're called the house of, um, Joseph, we're called Ephraim. I like to say it a little more Hebraically, Hebraically that's why Ephraim. Uh, we're Samaria, uh, Samarians, the northern kingdom. This is what, and this seed uh, has done what the Father, the blessing, which is a spiritual, I mean, if the Father says, I'm going to bless your seed, which is the word, always, we, you know, take the word seed, translating your mind to we're talking about the descendants the offspring the children all those all the way down the generations um but that this reality of the two houses which happened historically after solomon has been the story biblically and prophetically until we really get to the point where we are today known as the restoration of all israel they were a united kingdom with David. Just, you know, anybody read the history. But the promise from the Father is that he will draw us back to the land and he will give us our firstborn inheritance. But let me give you just three quick verses. You know, prove my point. I'm not making this up. This is actually in the text. So it says in Ezekiel 37.22, and, and I just pulled this out, but it did say, and they will never again be two nations or divided into two kingdoms. Here Ezekiel's prophesying of the final restoration. So these two groups, Christianity and uh, the Jews, we're, we're really one people worshiping one God with one um, destiny. And it's very clear there. They will never again be two nations or divided into two kingdoms. And if you read larger context, he's going on talking about the house of Judah, the house of Israel. In Jeremiah 31, 31, he, it says, the prophet says, days are coming. This is, see, this is going to prove my, beginning to prove my point. He says, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So right there, again, their prophets are not confused. Their understanding seen down the road that, and the thing is the word new, that's not in there, <laughs> you know, well, actually the word new, but what it means in the Hebrew, it's a word that means more. He will renew. He will refresh. He will repair the breach. So that's why he will, um, he's going to correct the breach that uh, happened at the fallen tabernacle of David. 
So it's very important, these little nuances, because you don't know, get all kind of theological things going on here if it's a new covenant versus a renewed covenant. Did Yeshua make a new covenant at Passover with his disciples, or did he renew the covenant with them? Very important. And the Hebrew obviously is leaning more towards renew, repair, refresh, restore. Jeremiah 7, 15, it says, And I shall cast you out of my presence. Again, Jeremiah is talking to the house of Judah, and he says, And I will cast you out of my presence, as I have cast out all your brothers, the seed of Ephraim. Ephraim. Okay, so... This is the language, and I just encourage people now when you start reading your Old Testament, go back, read Jeremiah, read uh, Ezekiel, read Isaiah. It's it's like all over. And now what the next step would be, well, we got to kind of pull these prophecies apart, and we have to see in light of that what's addressed to Judah, what's addressed to us. I mean, everybody kind of sees now that the prophecies addressed to Judah that he would bring them back to the land, that he would establish them again, that they would be a sign and a witness in the last days. Okay? But there again, you got to ask, well, okay, that's the Jews. What about us? Right? So there's a verse, but part of it is because, and again, like I said, I'm not trying to bring, well, I am trying to stir people up to, to want to do better research or to just check um, check this out, and that we have to be more on our guard. We have been slumbering, unfortunately, for a very long time, and there are some consequences for that. And these inconvenient truths, you know, trying to, you know, stir people up to think that maybe things aren't always what they seem, and <laughs> and then along with the fact that we are very biblically illiterate. Most people don't even know the history of the two the, 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 you know, the one nation under David to Solomon and then the split and what the split was about and how, um, that is, that is actually, well, I won't get into, when you study that, you can see again this tension, this, this unresolved issue. How do these all 12 tribes kind of work together? Because Ephraim and Judah have a history with each other. But I won't go into that. But there's a verse. This is this one cracked me up, and this is all I'm going to share. Um, Genesis 29, or no, sorry, Genesis 49, 22. It's extremely important. Um, it's a prophetic verse. I mean, here is a verse where Jacob, the great patriarch, is blessing his sons. He's blessing Joseph. And if you read it in this, I'll give you some of the translations, and then I'll give you the Hebrew, and I hope you'll scratch your head like hi. <laughs> all right? So, um, let's just start here. I have my, I have a, I have Bible Hub, free, you know, not uh, online Bible study helps app, which everybody should have one or two or of these kind. Uh, I've always used this one, whatever. But in the verse, let's just read it. In the New International Version, it says, Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. You know, you got to kind of scratch your head and go, oh, it's very flowery. Okay, what's he talking about? <laughs> you know, that's very flowery, allegorical. But is it then the new living? Well, I should come back to this. Let me let me read a couple of these. The Berean Study Bible says Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine by a spring whose branches scale a wall. Same kind of theory thing. King James says Joseph is a fruitful bough, even a fruitful bough by a well whose branches run over the wall. So, you know, what I mean is I always go to get out my Bible app and I'm checking on the words. So let's just start here. But just to prove to you in Hebrew, the word Joseph here, and uh, I mean, you can do this with me if you got the app. Uh, let's see, where do I want to, you go up here, there's a little thing, you can go to the Hebrew. And first of all, just let me say the name Joseph, the word for Joseph, even in the name, in the Hebrew, the blessing of multiplication and fruitfulness is in the name. Because Joseph, it means he increases. It means, it means that 
it, it, it indicates that upon his name, he received the blessing of multiplication and fruitfulness. All right. See, you understand, different. Abraham got both. God said to Abraham, I will make you a great nation and many nations and kings will come out of you. But then he also said um, he got the, the birthright of the firstborn that through Isaac, through faith, that that was where the, the righteous seed uh, and that's but but what I want to say is during the time when Jacob he he divided this unified birthright that went from Abraham to Isaac and at Jacob he divided it between kind of Joseph and Judah the two of the sons there and there's a whole history too about uh, well I won't even get into that Joseph or uh, is not his sons Ephraim and Manasseh they they get like adopted as uh, Jacob adopts them as and puts them in the same position as his biological legitimate son. So now these two sons have a right to it is an equal inheritance in the division of the land with the tribes. But the word again, Jacob, it, it's it's sort of right encrypted in the word. It means to add, to increase, to add more and more. To can, so right there you have a, a what's called a key. That the the name the the name is synonymous with what he's carrying. This is these, this is how the the texts are become very archetypal. They have large archetypes just sort of built into it. And then of course there is a guy named Joseph, and we know the story of his life. But here's where it gets interesting. The word fruitful. Uh, okay, that's fine. It means to bear fruit, to be fruitful. And again. We're reading it in the context of offspring, descendants. Um, it's the word uh, Zara comes through this. He will bear fruit. He will have a lot of children. Okay. The uh, the word vine. Okay. Click it. It's, it's, it's the word Ben. The word Ben is the word son. Okay. Now, if you were to click a little more on the program here, None of the other usages of this word son has anything to do with a vine. There's no other, uh, what's the word, um, vegetative adjectives where they could have pulled that from. All right. Cause it's, 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 um, all brothers, children, uh, grandchildren, children's children, fellows, foreigner, foreigners. Uh, it's all about people. All right, 99% of them are, and it's it's translated, let me see if I have it here, 2,369 times son. So why would the translators pick vine? Okay, we'll just leave that there. It is obviously there's no other precedent for that word. But then it gets better because then it goes on to say, by a well. So then he's a fruitful, he's a fruitful uh, by, or by, by, uh, he's a fruitful vine, which means son. So he, by a well, okay. Well, the word well, <laughs> if you look that up, that is the word for I. I'm, it is, it's ayin, which even the letter ayin in Hebrew, that's what it means. It means I, it means eyes, I or eyes. The first usage in Genesis, it, it's you shall eat from it, your eyes will be opened. I mean, eyes. Okay, so again, where are they getting this from? All right, and I'm not saying this to, to undermine anyone's faith in the text. I'm just trying to say, look, we have to be ever vigilant. And we haven't uh, to a large extent in some ways because the reason we've lost our identity, it's not an accident. Satan's been at it for a long time <laughs> to kind of cloud our eyes. And, and you know, again, it's interesting, uh, so that we don't really see what the text is saying. All right, so we got the word son, and then all of a sudden it translate becomes vine. We got the word well, that all is really the word I. It's you, and it's used 277 times as the word sight. Okay, now if you go back to... Um, uh, this is the next one. He's a fruitful, well, um, his branches. 
I mean, guess what does the word branches mean? <laughs> it means daughters. It's the word bait. Bat, b b a t h bait bait. It's a it's a bet, and it's a rat. Uh, I'm sorry, let's get this right. It's a bet. Second letter of the Hebrew alphabet, bet, and it's a a tav, which is a t sound. Bet. Okay, but it means daughter, and it's always translated daughter, daughters, granddaughter, maidens, woman, one time, but it's it's female, it's women, it's daughters. That's the what's inherent in the word. All right. So that's we're just you know it really doesn't get better per se. Okay. So these branches run, which is pretty good. It means means to march, to run, to over the wall. Okay. But the word the wall is used in a literal sense. But the thing is, it's root. It's from the same as a root word, and this is what's interesting, as the word bullock, or ox, or you know, head of cattle, a large head of the cattle family. But uh, Ephraim is called in other verses. One of the idioms that are used for Ephraim is ox, is bullock. That's why actually on end signs. You know, you always see the Lion of Judah, but people don't understand the other icon of there is, is a bullock, is an ox, because you have Ephraim and Judah. They're always the two largest archetypes representing the two nations, the two kingdoms. So to put it together, now, though that's not confusing enough, that you would never really see. Now, let me tell you what the translation is really saying. <laughs> uh well, and so even if you went to, I checked a bunch of these translations. They're pretty much all on the same page, fruit of vine running over a wall. Except when you get down here to one that is called, uh, where did I see it? Ben, the Brenton Septuagint translation. It's saying that, and it, it actually translates it absolutely correctly. But it's the Septuagint translation it must be it's an english translation of a septuagint the septuagint is really the the one of the oldest and the most respected and all scholars agree it is a phenomenal old testament translation that was put together about 200 bc and it's been a standard translation for for and, and very well documented research and scholars have no problem with it and it translates it correctly so it says, Joseph is a son increased. Exactly what, I'll read the whole thing. My dearly loved son is increased. My youngest son. So how can it be that the Septuagint, the Jewish translation, is absolutely correct in the way the words are used. Here we are with our English translations that are totally glossed over, and then you wonder why we don't know who we are, <laughs> okay? But let me give it to you for the real clincher. In the New Living, and this one just, I have no idea where this came from, but it said, Joseph is the fowl of a wild donkey. The fowl of a wild donkey at a spring, one of the wild donkeys on the ridge. Now, if you have a new living, go check it. I I can't imagine Bible Hug got that wrong, but where do you even get wild donkey? I mean, that's so far removed. <laughs> so far removed. And I'll tell you a little secret. This really irritates me because having an understanding more Hebraic mindset, <laughs> a donkey is an unclean animal. So this is like a slap. This is like... The, I mean, this is so in my in my opinion, like so in your face. You don't, you won't catch this in a million years. Joseph is the fowl of a wild donkey. All right. Now I'm going to read it to you in the uh, the uh, uh, the stone edition. Again, this is a stone edition. This is a, a a more modern translation, but this is probably one of the most respected Jewish translations you can get out on the market. An art scroll. Um, uh, what did I say? <laughs> the stone edition. Okay. And it reads it right here. 
It says a charming son is Joseph. A charming son to the eye. In other words, we know jo Joseph was a very attractive young man. That's what goes with his story. Otherwise, Potiphar's wife wouldn't be all over him, obviously. So each of the daughters climbed heights to gaze. So we have the word correct, translated correctly, daughters, and it says they embittered him and became antagonists. The arrow-tongued men hated him. But what's interesting in this, so first of all, there is the absolute correct translation from a Hebraic mindset using correct Hebrew. And it's important to understand this because and it, it totally what I told you what the words mean. A charming son, Joseph, is a charming son to the eye. The word I the word um, that they wanted to translate a well is the word I am, which is the word I. But when you read See, one of the things I've learned about Hebrew text <laughs> is you have to understand that the, 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 the Torah sages have been entrusted by Elohim, and they take it very seriously, to accurately transmit the storyline. And so there are so many texts and books that record histories, that record the genealogies, that record you, you could never put all of this into our Bible, people. This is what I'm saying. You would be carrying a suitcase, and then you'd have to have a U-Haul behind you of, of other reference books, all right? They have such extensive writings and, and, and keeping forward all this information so that the sages have accurate resources to go to to check, you know, on their translations. Something that we... Ephraimites don't have because when we left the land, you know, we didn't bring our Bible. I mean, we didn't in the sense, all right? This is a very important to the storyline. But to make my last point here, it says each of the daughters climbed heights to gaze. They embittered him and became antagonistic. See, the story, there's so much more to the story of Joseph and why he is such an, he's elevated in our Bible text as such a, a um, an archetype, the, and we get this concept of Messiah ben Joseph. Yeshua, Jesus, is the archetype in his first coming of, of this Messiah, of this archetype of Joseph. One of the things that Joseph, when you read the story of Potiphar's wife in some of the other writings, okay, there's a writing called um, uh, The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. It was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's very highly prized, authentic, writing and in my next well I won't go there all right and they'll tell you that Joseph was very attractive so there was a lot of temptation for him to sin sexually because here he is he's away from his home his family he's he's a young kid he's thrown into a stranger's house who are not tour keeping you know they're not his people he's got the wife uh <laughs> You know, after it, it, think about. It. I mean, the guys got some got some warfare going on. You know, but he it says he stayed strong. My bow, but his bow was firmly placed, and his arms were gilded. In other words, in the power um, from the hands of the mighty power of Jacob. From there, he shepherded the stone of Israel. Now, there's a lot I won't go into, but in other words, it, it talks about when Joseph was elevated, especially with Pharaoh. He's a, he was still, a, he was, you know, a very attractive guy. The women would throw themselves on him. See, because if you notice here, it says each of the daughters climbed heights to gaze. And they actually will tell you this story. There's like, like, here's Egypt, in, in you know, going down Pennsylvania Avenue, let's just say. And he's just been elevated to this. And he's second in command of Pharaoh. And obviously everybody's out. And the women are throwing him their, it says their earrings and their watches. And they're probably taking off of you know, and all to get his attention, to get him to look up, to, to acknowledge, to give him a little wink. I'm like, you know, no, but he is so, you know, disciplined. This is the whole point. His character is so strong, he doesn't succumb even then. This is, and this storyline, and I really have always said that I encourage, I would encourage anyone, especially youth leaders, oh my gosh, to get this book, The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, to read it, because especially on the story of Joseph, it is such a helpful 
Bible study aid to help young people to understand, you know, on a level of sexual temptation. You can't beat it. And I've read, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, if I was a youth group leader still, which I was one, I'd be reading it to my kids. I said, look at this. This is just, this is, yeah. So this is why I'm kind of hepped up on what I'm doing. And I'm just trying to encourage people. It, the, the slumbering days are over. We really are in a spiritual world. It is ratcheting up. And we need to get our eyes wide open in so many areas. There are so many pockets of deception out there. And unfortunately, but why should we be surprised? It's crept into our translations. So we don't even, and it's been happening very deliberately. I'm sorry, but I think the other side is very organized and they have a lot of agendas and they have plans. To, but, but that we don't know who we are and that no one taught us this. And it's really not their fault because the teachers before them taught. You know, so this has been a game of telephone away from the war that's been going on literally for about 1800, 1900 years. And what I want to tell my friends, and it's so exciting, there is such a move of God. There, one of the biggest moves of God going on right now is Christians are seeing this, discovering this, and going back to their Hebrew roots. Because that's where we're supposed, that's the prodigal. I mean, I told you, we're the prodigal. Judah's the older brother. That's what it's all about. And Yeshua is saying, I'm going after the prodigal. You can come, but we're not home yet. <laughs> I think. We're one nation under one God, indivisible, where there will be liberty and justice for all. So I just wanted to share that. And I wanted to um, use that kind of, again, as a stepping off point, again, to make my case that it's important. We need to know who we are because the nations, biblically they're called the nations, are rising up against Ephraim in unprecedented ways. And the birthright that is on Ephraim is the birthright of there to be the military and the economic superpower. That's if they're at the top of their game, the top of their game, living righteously in that is the blessing. So they will be able to feed the peoples mentally, spiritually, emotionally, in every way, truths that come from Torah. They will do everything according to the book. Ephraim has a huge destiny. We have, we are the salt of the earth. That's what Paul was talking about. Or you should, we're the salt of the earth. So it, to me, it's just important. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hammer away, whatever. I got nothing else to do. We're in isolation. And, <laughs> you know, that this is an eye opener, a game changer, and a revelation that I want to share with my brothers and sisters here. And I love you. I have a YouTube channel. I have a website with a lot of blogs and posts that goes more into depth on this stuff. So if you're more interested, Facebook me, call me. Let's just um, love it. Let's midrash about it. Let's talk about it. So on that note, said what I want to say. I'm out of here. I'm going to go enjoy the food.